Before you watch my video, I recommend you go watch Alternate History Hub's What If California Was an Island? A lot of this video is inspired off of that. So sit back and enjoy. Climate affects habitation just as much as geography does, and climate is a major part of the reason people live where they live today. Of course, nowadays we have air conditioning and electricity, which means you can live in the hottest deserts or the coldest mountains and still be relatively comfortable. But not back then. They didn't have fancy fans like we do today. So inhabiting a desert was no easy feat. But what if Arizona had oceanfront property? The island of California was a beautiful fictional island of paradise written in an old Spanish romance novel, The Adventures of Esplandian, which of course is where we get the name for the state of California, where I live, which is not an island. Now, something Alternate History Hub brought up in a video they recently created is such a scenario, where California was an island. They went over the geography and how this new island would have historically impacted the western United States. Something I want to touch on is the climate of what that region would be like. After all, much of California's population lives on the western coast, and this is because of its cool year-round temperatures where you don't really need air conditioning. California's coast is mostly a Mediterranean type of climate which usually has mild winters and warm summers, or in some places really, really hot summers, summers that are on fire. Often what you'll hear about California is the lovely dry weather and those fires I mentioned lots of them. But also really pleasant weather, like in San Diego with the fairly consistent sunny beaches, 72 degrees Fahrenheit and a breeze from the ocean. Or San Francisco, which never exceeds temperatures above 70 degrees during the summer, usually. Most of California's coast is nice and cool year-round, with a large marine layer that stretches across the state. This, of course, is thanks to the cold California current that flows from the North Pacific south along the western United States shoreline and all the way down to the Baja of California. But now that there's a massive canyon, the California current has a new direction to flow, eastward into that huge chasm of death. The cold waters will now be flowing in two directions, affecting a few different things in the southwestern United States and northwestern Mexico. The weather in these regions of what is today western Arizona and northern Mexico will be a little colder, not just due to the shift in cold water, but also because of the Straits of Cortez. They will bring about high winds, some very intense high winds that are good for kite flying. With the cold from the height of these cliffs shooting down into the canyon as warm air rises and cold air sinks, this could chill the waters even further, creating a cooler, more marine type of climate along the coastline of Arizona, Mexico, and eastern California. Likely, this passage would almost be impossible to navigate with a boat due to the current rushing through the canyon and strong winds that are pushing southward. However, these winds would likely calm once they reach the Sea of Cortez, and coming along with those winds is likely going to be some fog and mist rolling along those southern shores. Now with these fogs and winds like they are, it's actually possible that some redwoods or similar pine tree species could be thriving in these new southern regions of the United States where the Mojave Desert once was. Which brings up a really interesting point. What happens to the Mojave Desert in these conditions? Well, funny you should ask. Likely, the region will still exist due to most of this region still lying in a rain shadow from California's high mountains. However, it would likely be smaller in size. Once you head farther east towards Arizona's mountains past Phoenix, likely the area will become very dry like California's southernmost portion of the Central Valley. Still almost desert, but not quite. Most of the region that's going to be greener is going to be hugging the shoreline. Likely as you head inland, these areas will start to dry up. And since we're talking about Arizona and the southern United States, let's bring up something interesting. Monsoons. I personally love monsoons. Arizona is home to very large monsoon storms. Same with New Mexico and Utah, Southern California and Nevada. A lot of those southwestern states get big monsoon storms during the summer months from June till around September. And this is due to the shift in winds and moisture being picked up from the south along the Gulf of Mexico and sometimes hurricane moisture from along western Mexico that travel north. When the desert of Arizona heats up, as well as any other desert, it often creates an area of low pressure. This area of low pressure will often draw in moisture, 
That's why when you hear the news say something something high pressure, it's often sunny because the high pressure pushes the air and the clouds out of the area. But with low pressure, it pulls air in, and this is where you see monsoons come in. However, now that western Arizona is colder, likely the monsoonal weather will shift a little more east because of the cold air coming from the coast. Now with that being said, this would likely affect native populations I think historically. Tribes like the Pueblo of Navajo I think would move westward towards these coastlines in Arizona and northern Mexico. Since Arizona and Mexico have some low-lying lands on by the coast, as well as Southern California, you have to remember Death Valley is 200 feet below sea level. A lot of that desert side of the mountains in the Sierra Nevadas is pretty close to sea level. Likely, I think the natives would take advantage of that and inhabit the shorelines of those regions. Phoenix, I think, would likely become a coastal city during Mexican colonialism along with Guaymas, at least in the areas. They might not be called Phoenix or Guaymas necessarily, it is alternate history. But I think this region of the southwest could be heavily populated like modern day San Francisco or Los Angeles are. Though likely, I think there could be one more major port city along California's eastern shoreline for trade and exploring the Big Island. Not sure what it'd be called, but let's give it a fun name like, uh, eh, San Frangelis. These three cities would be the U.S.'s connection to the Big Island. Might a bridge be built? Possibly. Though going by the image made from Alternate History Hub, the gap between the land is, well, massive, averaging what I imagine to be 50 to 100 miles in width from Arizona to California. So it is possible a bridge could be built from east to west. China does currently have the longest bridge in the world spanning a massive 102 miles. But this would be a huge undertaking, and plus it'd take forever to drive across that bridge. Another question comes up though with this. Why build this big major port city in Eastern California? Well, if not for trade, which trade would be one of the biggest things, the same reason people climbed the Sierra Nevada mountains and died climbing those mountains to get to Sutter's Fort. Gold. Gold would still likely have some major drive in bringing California a lot of population. It may take place later than it does in our timeline, but people will go to great lengths to get some shiny rocks. And just because California is now a major island with insane tourist attracting cliffs, doesn't halt people from trying to explore the region. California would likely be a very populated place, I think. And if the gold rush was late enough, then much of the mining that took place in the 1800s wouldn't actually affect the natural beauty of the landscape. Perhaps some of the redwoods on the northern portions of this island would remain far more untouched than our redwood forests in California are today due to the difficulty of shipping lumber early on. And because of this, maybe those redwoods are even bigger and taller than those already in California. Likely, I think the population centers would shift slightly compared to what they are today. After the discovery of gold, I imagine the Central Valley would be home to a few sparse populations at first, but over time get bigger due to the very fertile soil in California's Central Valley. And of course, transportation, when that picks up and improves over time, People are going to want to do trade, they're going to want to move gold, and all that good stuff. Now, Coastal California by San Francisco might see some less population in the area, though, and I think this is due to everyone moving to what I think will be the more ideal location, the Sea of Cortez. The low-lying lands of eastern California, western Arizona, and Sonora would likely be the major tourist and population center of the area, much like Los Angeles in our timeline. Of course, this is all just the theory, and I think it's fun to theorize about weather and climate, and how they could affect the population, history, and geography of the area. Now take to heart that I am not a weather expert at all. I'm just someone who finds it fascinating and fun. And the same goes for geography. And I think the two, geography and climate, go hand in hand. What do you think the weather would be like in this new western United States? Leave your comments below, and let's begin theorizing how this weather would be 